Hello my small fat adaptive family and welcome back to the Keto Kitchen. It is the Roaring Twenties on week five of the Great British Bake Off. When we think Roaring Twenties, we think of everything Great Gatsby. We think of Flapper Girls, Through to Gangsters, we think of Prohibition, which was the banning of alcohol, we think of Charlie Chaplin, and lots of arty things like Art Deco, commercial radio, and actually the Oscars was first held in the 1920s as well. But how does that translate into baking? Well, initially you think it's probably all in the design, you know, having Art Deco, everything, but you've got to remember that all recipes started somewhere at some point in time. So this is what they did this week. The signature bake was custard pies. They just had more decoration and different flavors to them. Why custard pies with a 1920s theme? Now your brain probably goes straight to slapstick comedy and the smashing of custard pies in the face. I don't think that's why they chose it. I think it was because these, these tarts, these pies were around in the medieval times, right, throughout Europe and they were you know quite well known within predominantly England and Portugal but they actually became what we know them as today in 1927 in China chefs would migrate to Hong Kong and they'd go via ports that were in Europe so while they were in Europe they'd pick up these English Portugal European recipes and they'd take them home with them to Hong Kong and China and all over the eastern world and what happened was that they ended up adapting the recipes that they got from Europe because of the cost of ingredients, which actually in turn fed back into the rest of the Western world and became what we know as the predominant custard tart, custard pie recipe that we use today. And also, if you're watching this and what you know as a custard pie or a custard tart is completely different to what you saw on Bake Off, it might be because you name them something different. You may call them uh, egg tarts or egg pies. You know, here in England, we have to be difficult and we call them egg custard pies or tarts, custard pies and custard tarts. The technical was beignets with jam and sabignon. Beignets are like square, holeless, deep fried donuts. And sabignon is sort of a Italian custard sauce. Beignets were actually created in ancient Rome they, they came to New Orleans because they're known in New Orleans. They came to New Orleans in the late 19th century, but they became like iconic to New Orleans in the 1920s. So that's where beignets fit into the Roaring Twenties. And the showstopper is really the only one that doesn't need an explanation. Two-tiered boozy cakes. Prohibition meant that drinking was illegal, but being illegal doesn't mean that they didn't do it. So why not get the contestants to make alcohol cakes? Now that our little history lesson's over, let's talk about why I chose what I'm making today. In terms of the beignets, I like getting fancy on this series, right? You know, whereas the rest of my channel is quite simple and easy to follow, I like sort of challenging myself and getting a bit fancy in this Great British Bake Off series. But I am not that fancy. Plus, I don't have a good track record with hot oil, so I really cannot be bothered to be tending to burns on my arms and hands for the next week. And the two tier cakes, I don't drink. So I just, I really just didn't have an interest in this one. Now talking about boozy cakes, Ginger, who ketifies the category of the week, the day before the episode airs this week, has done a no-bake Bailey's cheesecake. And even though I don't drink, it looked absolutely stunning. It's a fat bomb, it's keto, it's everything a keto alcohol lover would love. So all of that leads me into the custard pies. Now I've never had custard that's been flavored with anything but vanilla you know maybe some nutmeg at christmas but nothing intense you know just your standard plain vanilla custard i don't want to have anything but vanilla custard but i don't want to decorate flapper girls onto the top of my custard pie because that's what david did and david was the only one that did a vanilla custard and i'm recreating something that i see from the show every week without my vanilla custard my choices were like 90% lemon or lime. I'm going to sacrifice my vanilla custard pie and I'm going to ketify Alice's chocolate and orange custard pie. This will consist of a cocoa tart base, an orange flavored custard that is baked into that tart base and a simple chocolate ganache as decoration. As always, a few notes before we start. Number one, Paul said to Alice, 
don't use orange extract in the custard. I'm not gonna buy oranges just to use them for the zest. So, uh, yeah, I'm gonna pretend he didn't say that. Note number two is they had to make four pies. We're just making one big one. And number three, as always, I have one shot at making this. I have not made this recipe beforehand. I don't actually think I've ever made a custard pie, ever. I created this recipe about 12 hours before standing in front of you here and doing this video. So I haven't had time to even give this recipe a go. I've just got to trust my gut that it will work. And if it doesn't, you get to see that all on camera. Let's get cooking. In terms of ingredients, for the tart base, you will need half a cup or 50 grams of almond flour, a quarter cup or 25 grams of cocoa powder. Always, always, always check the carbs before you buy cocoa powder because a lot of time they just add sugar. I actually find a lot of the time the like own brand ones like Asda Zone, Tesco Zone, they seem to have lower carbs generally, but just make sure you check. Half a cup or 41 grams of flax seed meal, also known as linseed. Two tablespoons of sweetener. 28 grams or an ounce of butter that has been melted. And one egg. For the custard filling, you will need two eggs, one egg yolk, three tablespoons of sweetener, half a teaspoon of orange extract, one and a half cups or 345 ml of heavy, or we call it in England, double cream. And for the topping, which is just a simple chocolate ganache, you are going to need 20 grams of dark chocolate. Try and go as dark as you can, because uh, we'll make it quite milky anyway. I'm using 85% lint chocolate, which is kind of just the go-to for me. 40 ml of heavy slash double cream and one teaspoon of sweetener. Okay, so the method. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna make the cocoa tart base and then we're just going to store that in the fridge for half an hour, let it chill. Really, really easy. In this bowl, I have almond flour and I'm going to add the dry ingredients of the base. So that's flaxseed, the cocoa powder, don't worry about sieving it because we'll just mix it really well, and the sweetener. Give that a really good mix. Make sure it's nice and well combined. Try and get all those cocoa lumps out. I'm aiming for nice, thick, dense custard and the base is just kind of there to complement it. It's not, you know, the main event. Right, once that is all nicely mixed you want to take your egg pop that in and then you're going to take your melted butter and pop that into you should mix just until it starts to come together because if you over mix it you run the risk of making it crumbly when it you know comes out the oven and i've just got a sheet of cling film here or plastic wrap or ceram wrap now it doesn't look like there's much here but trust me you've you've got enough and then really simply wrap that up I always suggest you kind of put it into a ball just to make sure that it's all attached to itself. That then goes in the fridge for half an hour. In about 20 minutes, when I've got 10 minutes left in the uh, fridge, I will be putting the oven on so that it's ready for when we're ready to go and put this in the tart pan. And you want it on 180 Celsius or 350 Fahrenheit. So it's been half an hour, the oven's preheated. We are ready to transfer our dough into our tart pan. I am using a baking pan and I've put in the tart in it. And the reason I'm doing this, and I highly suggest you do, is because there's less chance for an accident when it comes to the custard. You don't want something that's jiggly and sloshy in a pan that you don't have full control of. If you use a baking sheet, it's all level, it's all fantastic. It's easy to move around. All I'm gonna do, is use my hands. You can use, you know, rolling pins or whatever you like. I just find it easiest to do it with my hands is I'm gonna flatten it out across the base and make sure you try and get it up on those sides as much as possible because we're going to be filling this probably to the brim with custard. And try and make that base as flat as possible without causing tears and such in it. Try and make it all even. Now obviously remember, I didn't mention because I'm using a silicon tar, if you're using a metal one, a tin one, make sure you give it a proper grease or line it with greaseproof paper, or whatever you need to do to make sure that your tart doesn't stick to your pan. So I'm making this tart base really quite thin because like I said, I want a thinner base that just complements the custard more than anything. So now I am left with that. That is our tart base. And when you're happy with your tart base, what we're gonna do is blind bake it. Blind baking just basically means pre-baking it a little bit before we put in 
our filling, which in this case is custard. I'm just a little bit nervous about these edges with blind baking because you know after this is going to be going in the oven for a lot longer and especially with cocoa cocoa has a habit of making things taste like burnt so whilst I, when i blind bake it what i'm going to do is i've got some tin foil here and i'm doing this just to prevent those edges from burning because you know they they will be the first place to burn you just want to make sure you can't see those edges going up the side last thing i'm going to do before this goes in the oven is take a fork and just stab holes in the base this is just to help with, you know, potential rising that might happen. Okay, this will now go in the oven for 12 minutes. I'm going to check it after 10, but I'm going to say it's probably going to be about 12 minutes and that will be our blind bake. So I will see you then. So I'll tart out the oven. It was in there for about 11 minutes. At 10 minutes I checked it and it was starting to rise. So I just pricked some more holes in it with a fork. It very quickly went back down. I left it for another minute. I feel like it's ready to rumble. So I'm just going to take the tin foil off. Then what you want to do is you want to lower your oven to 160 Celsius or 320 Fahrenheit. In this bowl, I have my two eggs. To my two eggs, I'm going to add my egg yolk, my orange extract, and my sweetener. And that's just gonna get a really good whisking. And then you're sort of left, when you've done it, you're left with a uniform sort of very orangey smelling sc scrambled eggs. So to the scrambled eggs, I'm going to add my cream. Uh, I'm a little bit nervous about the cream because looking at it, that's a lot of cream. That is a lot, a lot of cream. So it may be that I have some of this filling left over we're just gonna roll with it. So add your cream, make sure you give it a really good whisk so that you don't have like that stringiness from the egg whites in the mixture, you wanna beat that out of it. So we take our tart, which is cool enough to touch the pan now, and we just add the filling until we get up to that edge. This is why it's important to make sure your edges are even, because you know, I can see I've got a little bit of edge that's dipping down here, which means I can't fill it up to where the rest of the tart is because of that edge. I don't know if you can see that, but you should be able to see why it's important to have it on a baking sheet. Because just ever so slight movements and that is just coming backwards and forwards like a rough tide. This goes back in the oven for 20 to 25 minutes. The way to know it's done, I check it in about 20 minutes, is to just give it a bit of a jiggle. And when you jiggle the pan, the custard should jiggle, but not be like sloppy. It, you know, it should be firm and, and set and sort of browning a little bit on the top at least. I'll see you when it's done. The pie is now out of the oven. I checked it at 20, it was nowhere near being done. I checked it at 25 and the edges were starting to brown on one side so I flipped it, cooked it for another five, still wasn't done. So 35 minutes later it's done. I can see it's sunk down in the pie, uh, especially on left hand side. That's fine. I'm not massively bothered about that. I'm more worried about the taste. It looks, it looks all right. It's jiggling. I'm really happy with it at the moment. So I'm gonna leave that there just to cool down a little bit and we're gonna start on our decoration, which is the ganache. The ganache is really simple, right? You wanna heat up your cream. Most people probably do this over a saucepan, but I whacked my cream in the microwave for 20, 30 seconds until it's hot enough. You add your sweetener and you just keep mixing until that's all dissolved in. If you've got it on a heat, you take it off the heat, and then all you do is add your chocolate. You don't even do anything to it, you walk away for five minutes. It's very similar to the chocolate tempering that I did uh, week two of the Bake Off, the um, cherry caramel biscuit bars. The only difference is this is much easier and there's no control of temperature or anything like that. Hot cream, put a sweetener in, dissolve the sweetener, add the chocolate, walk away for five minutes. After that five minutes, you just wanna very slowly stir it together. Now, I can't express how slowly you wanna do it. You really wanna take your time. It's gonna look all like it's not gonna mix and clumpy, it will. You just wanna mix it slowly to temper those two ingredients together, make it nice and glossy and thick. Like I said, similar to the chocolate, just thicker, creamier, not as much hassle. Even when you think all of it's mixed in, just keep stirring. So from this point, I've got two notes. If your ganache starts to separate, 
just add in a little bit of cream it's fine if it's cold and just gently stir it back in just a splash that should help with your consistency if it's too thin like mine that's that's way too thin we're trying to pipe that onto a cake onto a tart that's way too thin all i'm going to do is just add another chunk of chocolate I'm not too worried about the measurements with ganache because it's something I have quite a lot of experience in. At the end of the day, if I have too much ganache, which I can already see I will, it's absolutely delicious. So I'm not worried about having spare. If your cream is too cold to melt that bit of chocolate you've added, pop it in the microwave for about 10 seconds so it's not enough to cause separation or use a double boiler. If you're using a saucepan and you've gotten to this point, don't put it back on the heat, put it on a double boiler because the heat is very likely going to just burn up that chocolate and just make it separate more. Look, I get a big clump like that that comes down and then it just very slowly drips. It's very thick and goopy, but it's also glossy and smooth and beautiful. Take a glass, take a kitchen bag, put it over the glass and fold it in. Get a spoon, spoon in your ganache, flip it back over, straighten out the bag, Close the bag, make sure you get out as much air as possible. Squidge all of it to the side so that you've got a side with no chocolate on it. Get a pair of scissors, cut a minuscule little hole in that corner. There you go, you've got a piping bag. Alice did like a diagonal line, but because I'm cutting a whole one, what I'm gonna do is just do like a circle around the edge, maybe two circles. Yeah, I'll do two circles. I'm trying to keep it as even as possible. It's not gonna be perfect. And actually, I think I've got enough in this bag to do another circle. So I'm going to do another circle. This is what I love about this series, is I just make stuff up as I go along. And hey, look at that, I've got enough to do another circle. So I'm basically just making a bullseye out of this at this point. What I'm going to do with those bullseye circles, so they don't look like a five-year-old did them, is I'm going to get a cocktail stick. And much like we did on episode one, I'm going to drag the cocktail stick through, see what happens. I've made it into a spider web. Why not? It's coming up to Halloween. And my good old trusty powdered erythritol. And that, in all its uh, glory, <laughs> will go in the fridge for half an hour. And then we'll come back and do the usual taste test, macros, and so on. It's been half an hour. I'm happy with how it's cooled down and it's set. Sunk a little bit more. But I'm actually really enjoying this sort of ooky kooky dark cocoa base with this sort of spider web in the middle it looks actually you know pretty cool not only is it full and it's coming up to halloween this is sort of my little tip of the hat to helena because it wasn't her time to go and we all like a little bit of ooky kooky it's cute it's fun how does it taste now i know some of you are thinking ha ah, he's left it in the tart pan i did this on purpose and the reason i did this on purpose is not only is this tart pan absolutely battered you know so it's already got cuts and stuff in it i don't have a bottom releasing tart pan or anything like that and i think if i'd have gotten it out earlier i think it would have broken so instead i trust that this base and this egg custard will be able to take a blunt knife through it and at the end of the day if it doesn't take a blunt knife and i have to use a sharp knife i'll get another one of these on amazon for dirt cheap because this one's on its way out anyway yep cuts beautifully and easily the middle seems to be a little bit raw. I'm just gonna use a spatula and lift that up. Like that. Look at that, that's cute. With our trusty close-up camera set up, let's break into that, look at that. Oh no, it isn't raw at all. No, it's absolutely fine, it just hasn't fully set yet. Probably do with another sort of 10 minutes. But can you see, we've got a nice thick custard and that really thin base that I wanted. Wow. The orange is very, very subtle. But that egg custard is like biting into clouds. It's really soft and creamy. It's quite a bitter punch of the chocolate, but it's just the right sweetness. The orange comes over the chocolate just ever so slightly. It's very subtly taped, like uh, flavoured, sorry. Yeah, I'm really happy with that. I'm really, really happy with that. After last week's fiasco, we've come around the corner beautifully with a gorgeous chocolate and orange custard tart. In terms of macronutrients, it serves eight, eight slices. 
and each slice is 390 calories, 37 grams of fat, nine grams of protein, and three net carbs. So it's fantastically high in fat, it's pretty low in protein, and it's really low in carbs. So but this is an absolutely beautiful treat that you could probably have all year round, but I really think this is now going to become a Halloween thing for me with the spider web and everything. How cute. Join me next week for basically what I've been doing for four out of the five Bake Off weeks that I've ketified, and that is dessert week. Like this video if you find it interesting, insightful or helpful. Subscribe if you're inclined. Any questions, any comments, any queries, anything down below. Keep calm. Keep on. Thanks for watching.